thanks very much for uh, agreeing to uh, come on to our uh, show today. Um, our podcast deals with empowerment at uh, What's the Score? Uh, for those of you who don't know, Laura Sugar is a British Paralympic athlete who recently won gold uh, in canoeing in the uh, Tokyo Olympics. Laura, again, thanks very much this morning for, for, for agreeing to uh, appear on our show. We'll start right at the top. Laura, what does empowerment mean for you? Is it is a, a big word? What does it mean to you? Um, yeah, well, thanks for having me firstly. No problem. Um, yeah, I think empowerment to me is is being confident, in, you know, part of it, being confident in yourself and feeling, you know, trying to back yourself, but also empowerment can kind of come from other people. Mm. And I think in sport, as, especially as a female in sport, um, empowerment is key to you know going in and following your dreams and kind of saying yes to things and for me I think the ability to say yes to things is probably my definition of feeling empowered um, that you can you know you just take on anything and, and give anything a go um, but I do think it comes from surrounding yourself with great people as well because it's not just yourself that you know you're not putting it all on yourself to you know have those feelings but having if you create a good environment around yourself that kind of thrives and kind of you know builds on builds on each other and you thrive off each other and I think that's the kind of true definition of empowerment if you have that group of people especially you know related to my sport um we have an amazing group of of GB athletes and the reason why we did so well and we've progressed so well in our sport is because of the group not because of certain individuals um and we have that positive kind of atmosphere every day obviously some people have good days and bad days and everyone has that but as a group as a whole um generally when other people are having those, those bad days you have other people having a good days and they help each other get through and that's kind of for me the true definition of, of empowerment i think touching touching on a point you made there a bit positive mindset almost positive attitude um looking at your background um, yeah, I think you've had this since you were a little girl, weren't you? I mean, I know with 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 your parents, your mum and dad, they, they, you they they've said that you know you were the type of girl that was just you get on with it, and I think that was that was evident right from you know when you when you were a small girl. Is that the case? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, like I, I've always just yeah, I've always just said just things. I've always just, as you say, got on with it. And with, with my disability, it was you know my ankle was fused when I was before I was three years old so all the kind of procedures have been done there and and I just I really look at my parents kind of never kind of said you know held me back doing it but I just kind of would keep going until I reached kind of a problem that I struggled to do mm -hmm. rather than kind of waited but you know rather than stop before I got there I kind of push and push and push and I'm always a, a why not um but as you say it's, it's not always I think I decided I want to be like that there's there's some days of course there's quite a lot of days when my brain goes I really can't be bothered today I really don't want to do this yeah um but as long as in general that's your principle um then you know on those bad days you know that that, that then that will push you through like you can't be you can't be feeling that way every single day and pushing that way every single day but I think as I think I just as a little kid just decide I want to I want to do things and I want to keep going and and that then is the kind of you know, mm -hmm. common stability. Yeah, I, I think I'm probably right in saying it's you've you've not let your disability define you. If that's the right way to say it, you, you've you've gone on and done things, uh, and you've taken it to the limit and beyond sometimes. But you've not let the the disability as as is define who you are and what you do. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. And I think um, anyone that kind of has a, a disability of any sort, and that's you know physical, mental, that's, there's hidden disabilities, there's ones that are really obvious, um, that you don't, a lot of people, especially in kind of my world of sport, don't see that, that the disability as their main kind of mm. defining moment. And that as, and when you kind of see that as that everyone, everyone is just a human being um, yeah. and someone's got a disability or not, but there's other people that have, you know, other kind of, you don't define someone as a personality trait. You don't say, oh, well, they're a, uh, you know introvert extrovert why do you have to be defined as a oh you're a disabled person you're a non-disabled person yeah um and, and yeah there's sometimes obviously disabilities there's there's it's, it's called a disability for you know a reason which is you know i don't completely you know 
want to define a, a disability but it means that you do have you know sometimes you will struggle with some things because of your disability but other people struggle for other reasons um in life and I think especially within the realms of sport is that I am better off because I've been active and I've not let my disability stop me doing things and I know that re the rest of my body has adapted better um to cope with my foot because I haven't held back and because I've done sport and especially with, with with a lot of disabilities that I've come across in the Paralympics it's it's actually helped and you know even like the NHS are prescribing exercise as a as a medicine now um, and I'm not saying you know you have to do elite sport but I think the things that sport give you um, whether you've got a disability or not has helped um, so definitely by just ignoring what doctors said that oh, I'll be fine in everyday life as long as I don't really want to be a sports person um, that's kind of the best thing I've ever ignored. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's you, you're coming across here. It's like nothing, nothing's going to stop you. And I, I mean, that's certainly been the case here. I mean, if we if we take it back to to your your sporting success, actually, it didn't start in canoeing, did it? I think it was hockey, wasn't it? That was your first sport. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you then transitioned into to canoeing with the background to that? Yeah, so um, I've always, I've been a lover of all sports. I'm not like, a, oh, I, I've come across some people that, they, you know, they've done one sport and that's it. They're not just doing anything else. I've always loved every sport growing up. And I say like, I think in, especially with the Paralympic Games, I knew what the Paralympic Games were growing up. I never knew my disability was, was eligible because I think, especially in the media, you see um, like the Blade Runners, you see wheelchair athletes and you see guide, you know, uh, visually impaired athletes, or guide runners, you don't, you don't see there's so many other disabilities involved you know there's there's neurological disabilities there's intellectual disabilities there's um you know something you know you've got some people from a few fingers missing to four limbs missing um so there's a whole spectrum and i never you know it took me i watched london 2012 and that is literally i was 22 years old when i got into para sport um and looking back i probably would have of course i would have loved to have known about it and got involved in it earlier but I will kind of I'm living proof that London of what London 2012 did if it wasn't for London 2012 I might still not have known um about my disability so as I say I was 22 when I got kind of properly involved in Paris sport and so my whole up until that point um it hadn't it hadn't featured at all and um yeah I at primary school I didn't have many options I was at a really tiny primary school and they didn't really do sport but luckily there was loads of kind of little village um, activities in the local villages. So I kind of went to, you know, the quick cricket, multi-sports um, and just loved it. Um, I, my mum's from a farmer's family and, and she had a little horse and I tried, you know, I did horse riding. Absolutely. kind of loved that. And it was kind of really when I got to secondary school that my eyes were quite open to all these, these team sports. Um, and that's when I found a love for hockey. Um, and I started it in year seven and, and fell in love with it, got in the team. Unfortunately, started two days of school broke my leg horse riding at the weekend oh. so missed the whole I was quite a bad break and so I missed all the way up to Christmas which that is the girls hockey term at you know at kind of regular state schools and so I missed the whole of hockey and I thought I kind of missed the boat um and as you say it, it's quite often when you speak to anyone that has followed a particular path it's normally you know there's certain people involved with you know encouragement and whether that's a teacher whether that's a mentor and yeah for me it was a it was a teacher at school who he wasn't even a PE teacher he was a geography teacher and a deputy head um, but he loved hockey and I remember he was called Mr Scott and I remember in year eight so I'd kind of missed the year and I thought oh, I'm not in the team now I was you know a bit nervous to get involved and he was like why aren't you playing hockey you were you know you showed potential and I was like well everyone's already you know in the team I'm I didn't you know wasn't involved last year and he encouraged me to to get back involved so I decided I was a defender because I realized the C team had no defenders right. um, and I got stuck as a defender for my whole hockey career right. uh, maybe branch out in future try other sport <laughs> but yeah I learned to defend I learned to tackle and I learned to try and read the game as a defender's point of view and um, right. yeah I worked my way up into kind of the, the the A team by the end of the year and then I just fell in love I, as I said I loved all sports and I did every sport at school but hockey is the one I just I understood more Right. Um, like there's a lot of sports I just love playing I'll like you know I'll go and play whatever sport and take part in any sport but just could read the game and I just learned I just kind of got it mm -hmm. um, and fell in love with it and yeah really lucky that my school kind of had you know a teacher that loved hockey and a local hockey club in Zaffan Walden and 
and I kind of then built up from there. And the great thing about my hockey club, South Morden, was that it was mixed girls and boys. So from my first couple of years in, you know, in hockey, you were pushed because you played against the boys, which I'm a huge advocate for, you know, mixing up and mm. and um and I kind of got tougher as a defender because of that. Um, yeah, I was about to yeah, say that, Laura. You strike me as somebody who would not hold back. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get in the way of you when you've got that stick in your hand. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Right, okay, yeah. You, you kind of have to be as a defender. Like, yeah. actually being more brave, you get more you, you get more tackles and you actually get hit with the ball less if you're a bit more brave. So I learned, I learned that very quickly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, literally worked my way up through the kind of, then it was kind of counter the next year. And I'm kind of one that, I'm always, I'm never like, it's not that I'm not satisfied because I'm always really happy of where I am, but I always, it's always kind of the next goal, but I'm never like, oh, I have to get the next goal. Otherwise that's the end. But you know, once I kind of made the county team, I was like, well, let's try and make the regional team now. And then, yeah. So I'm always kind of, once I've made kind of one achievement, I'm like, right, what what can I do next and try to get? Yeah. So I then I was playing for East of England and um, they, they have kind of loads of different scouts there from all the the home nations and, and they knew that I my father was Welsh and um yeah so within kind of from starting in year eight this was kind of you know three or four years later but it was you know quite a quick um I think I then got selected to play I got um, invited for trials and then selected to play for Wales under under 16s and under 17s um kind of four years later so that was kind of my career and I, I went off to uni it was playing for Wales working my way up kind of under mm-hmm. 17s under 21s and then I got into the senior team um, and combined that with uni but as as a hockey player, unless you're kind of in the full GB setup, um, you can't make, you know, a career for it. And even then you just get, you know, you get some some lottery funding. There's but um so, so I you'd, decided you'd, I was you'd gonna made be the, you'd made the full Welsh national team at hockey. Yeah. Um yeah. So right. I, I think I've got sixteen caps before oh, I then okay. transferred across to uh yeah, like I was well, I just decided I was gonna be I was like, right, what career can I do sport? And play hockey at the, you know at the weekends and decided I was going to be a PE teacher. So right. after I'd finished my Leeds, I, I did a sport exercise science degree at Leeds and then I went to Birmingham to do PGCE. Um, right. And it was during that year I actually had a I had a forced year off in between Leeds and Birmingham. Right. And that was going to Birmingham, um, which is probably the blessing in disguise and probably the best thing that ever happened. But at the time it was really angry. Right. Um, and yeah, my I was I was selected. I'd literally just made it into the senior team. I'd got a couple of caps, and I was then selected to go to the World League tournament, which at the time for Wales that was one of the biggest, you know, the World yeah. League. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to miss three days of the start of the course, which you know was to get your degree course of yeah. my of my teaching course. Right. And the the head of the teaching course was like, no, you do this. You don't do anything else in your life when you do this. So you can either um, quit hockey or defer your year. Um, right, which to me, right. I was like, it's two or three days of the course. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to panic in. But again, you have people, luckily, have people around me. I, I knew the coach at Birmingham, Phil Goodwin, because he'd coached me at Wales. Um, and he said, well, I know there's a job going as a, as a hockey coach at rugby school down the road, and you can still play for us on the weekends because you can play for the Saturday, the club. Yeah, just to have a bit of perspective, how often were you training as a, a, a hockey? Was it almost every night you were doing that and, and you had your degree? Almost, course? yeah. Um, probably, yeah, three or four nights a week and then and then a game on a Saturday. But then when you're at uni, you have kind of a Bucks game on a Wednesday as well. So you right. normally have two games a week. And then when I was at Leeds Uni, I was, because Wales wanted to play National League, I was playing for the uni and then I was also playing National League for Wakefield on, on a Saturday. Mm. So I had two different training sessions to go to um, wow. for each of those. So I kind of um, amalgamated it. So I kind of went, yeah. Full throttle for but hockey. Did you, you didn't have any issues at all with your disability with this, or you just get on with it? Obviously, as I say, like there's loads of things that come along that you then struggle You're with. with. Them as I think, yeah, and I think you can get like in a team sport where there's skill involved as well. I I was still pretty fast, which is why then I went got, when I got into sport. I went to athletics because mm-hmm. I I knew I was quite fast anyway. Because you know, even in like the fitness tests. The ones I would struggle with were the kind of repeated turns. Yep. Because turning on my foot. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd lose a lot. I would actually be, co- I'd catch people up kind of midway through and then I'd do a turn and then I'd have to, you know, catch people up again. Whereas actually the out and out sprinting, I was still quite up there um, with the speed. Um, so as I say, like there were certain things like gym exercises, hopping, for instance, I can't do on my foot. There's, there's loads of exercises within my program that I kind of would have to adapt and struggle with. But actually... Sure. In the game, I think because I'd learned to play in just the way I played, 
probably obviously suited my foot because that's how I I'd learned to play. Um, and I had to learn early on, like, you know, not to plant your feet when you tackle because for me turning, you know, was, so I kind of, you can adapt your game a lot to kind of mitigate those. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'd never, there was obviously, there's quite a lot of times I got substituted and they said, oh, you're limping. So I took you off. I was right. like, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I just have a natural limp. Um, so you should get really frustrated with that. I was like, no, no, just, I have a natural limp because I don't know the ankle movement. So especially right. when I get more tired, it stiffens up more. It's like, can I go back on, please? <laughs> I'm fine. Um, but yeah, I think just having that attitude, you just you just keep going until there's something that you can't do. Right. That I then was then, and normally, as I say, it was it was kind of exercise or kind of certain drills, and I just would then find a different way around it. Um, but I think for me, working on my footwork for for hockey was you know key. If I got myself in the position, in the right position, yeah, then I was fine. So it's it's. I think I'm right in saying here it's it's your mindset, Laura. Here it's, it's it's coming through. It's you've you've come up against a barrier and you've not let it stop you. It's like right, I'll I'll find a way, whatever that way might be. I'll find a way to get around it and keep going, and keep going. I think that's that's coming through here. Um, but yeah, I think that's key as well because you know you there's too many people that will say no before even trying. Uh, and like so I feel like it's better to then try and then work our way around those obstacles because you know I could my parents could have easily you know when the doctor said oh you can't play sport would have easily like you know diverted me away from sport Mm -hmm. but they let me just go and get on with it Mm -hmm. um and then you work out you work out ways there's always a way to do something just it might be different to what the generic way is yeah yeah no that that's for sure but how did you then so you've you've got to a certain level at hockey, and it's a very high level. You know, playing for your for your national team. How did you then transition into to canoeing, and then? So yeah, well, canoeing's actually only happened a few years ago. Uh, I had an interim sport in between. I did um, so I, I, as I said, I would literally watch London twenty twelve. Um, right. And when I say I I would, I it was kind of in that year in the year off I had between between my two degrees that. And I think with my foot, like, so I can tell with l- looking at my foot. And when I point it out to someone, they then notice. Yeah. But it's not kind of obvious walking down the street. So my ankle is completely fused and you, I've got a different shape ankle. And then I have a really skinny leg because of there's no ankle movement. I don't build up a calf muscle. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's really obvious. And actually, there's um, it was a mixture, actually. A hockey, a doctor at Welsh Hockey kind of mentioned it during the games. And also um, a guy that's still competing called Dan Greaves, who does the discus throw. And, you know, when they do discus they obviously zoom in on your feet on the circle and I literally remember watching Dan at, at London and going I've got that foot same right um yeah and it was literally from that and I say the combination of the Dr Welsh hockey kind of mentioning it and that literally was was it I had never never seen my disability before in the Paralympics never knew that it was eligible and um so did a bit of research and there was um they did these sport fests at the time um I went to one in Surrey and it um at the sports park and basically whether you had a disability or not, whether you wanted to be competitive or not, you could go and just try out all the Paralympic sports. Um, and then they obviously had like coaches there, you know, spotting the people that, you know, be fit. Mm-hmm. and I was like, I'm going to, you know, my whole just say yes things. And there was a few times where I kind of got nervous. I was like, Oh, I don't want to, you know, yeah. the new people is going to be, and you know, it was a big thing to just turn up and be like, hi, I want to do sport. Mm-hmm. Um, but I knew I was quite fast and I knew I'd, I'd done like athletics for, for school and things like that. Um, and I'd seen athletics and I'd seen um, that category. So I say canoeing had not even come on my radar at this point. Um, again, even, and even my whole, even when I'd spent five years in, in Paralympic sport, I'd, I'd not seen canoeing because I, I saw all the banners and it was all wheelchair. Mm-hmm. I presumed, mm-hmm. you know, you've got to be in a wheelchair because it's more upper body. Yeah. Um, and I tried out, I tried out cycling because there was a massive queue for athletics. Um, and I thought, you know, hockey, I've, I've got strong thighs. I'll literally do some, some yeah. cycling. And then they kind of got a bit keen and then athletics came back over and they're like, Oh, we've got room for you to come and try now. Um, and went and like sprinted and cause I'd been training so much for, you know, I've been training to get faster for hockey. Yeah. Um, I had naturally had that speed. Um, and it kind of all went really quickly from that was kind of the December and then in March they were like, yeah, so we want to take you to get classified, um, and you have to do it in another country. So the next one that we're taking you to do, we're taking you to Dubai. You've got a race. 
and do a class you don't have to race fast you just have to turn up and do you know you have to do a medical classification so you get checked by a physio doctor mm -hmm. um and then you have to race so they watch you in the race as well to then confirm your your classification and i'd never i'd raced as i said I'd raced for school and things like that but always it was all kind of grass tracks and things like that so my first ever race in spikes was in dubai <laughs> which sounds really glamorous but we literally <laughs> turned up there for three days raced and came home um so yeah so that was a march that was like three months later as mm -hmm. it was quite quick because because I'd done because I'd been training before I wasn't a completely untrained um athlete. So, but sorry just um I, I'm clear here but that classification classification for what is it for what particular sport or whatever so, sorry. yeah every classification in every sport is different right this is partly my move across to canoe so you could be the bottom end of a category in one sport and at a disadvantage as such which I ended up being in athletics or the top end of one category because ah, right. you know, there's a spectrum they can't and athletics, there's a load of, you know, loads of categories. And so you could be one category in one and a different category in another. So every sport has its own classification system. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I was in T44 with athletics, which is all the 40s are limbs affected. Um, and number four was basically one leg affected right. below the knee. Okay. So they have split it now, but it was um, that you competed. Well, you still do compete with the blade athletes, but now we've been given a different name. And right. as I say, then... I still competed and I, I went to Rio. Um, I came fifth in the 100 metres and 200 metres. So it kind of was a really quick escalation, kind of three years building up to, to Rio. Um, but say I was, every year I'd kind of get faster, but every year the blade technology would then kind of take a step on. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, I, I think I won about six, seven European medals in athletics. Um, and then in the world, world stage, I'd never come lower than fifth but I'd never come higher than four. And every year it was kind of different people. I got faster and I was like, yeah, I'm, you know, in with shot yeah, medals yeah. now. And then, yeah. Um, so yeah, the Paralympic Games at the World Champs, that would always been my, my results. So I was always up there, but it did always feel, you know, a bit like a, a kind of, oh, right, every year yeah. I got faster. And then... Always know, a something. bridesmaid. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but I, <clears throat> excuse me, I was never going to stop athletics. I kind of, you know, I... I loved that sport and I was going into it. And I say yeah. then canoeing, it was 20, well, it was kind of end of 2017, but I didn't really find out about it till 2018. So there's a lot of talent transfer in Olympic and Paralympic sport. Right. Um, you see loads of the skeleton athletes, for instance, in the Winter Olympics, loads of them have come from heptathlon, sprinting, mm. the bobsled athletes all come sprinting, mm. rowing, they kind of have come across from other sports. And in the Paralympic sport, I'd say like you might be one end of a category in one and one end in another. And canoeing had actually approached, um, they kind of went about it the right way. They didn't kind of come, they don't want to go and steal athletes from other sports, but they approached my head coach right. and said, look, we, we need someone with, with a lower limb disability. We've, you know, we've, um, and we think she'd be really good. I think like did some gym tests and then knew what I could kind of lift in the gym and there was potential there. And so actually Paula did the, the nice, you know, knowing that I was always, I say always there or thereabouts. And she kind of said to me, she was like, look, go and give it a go what harm you know you can still you don't have to just quit and go straight over there's a you know you go and just go and try it out um and she was really supportive and yeah so towards the end of 2018 after my championships with athletics I went and got on a boat for the first time and yeah fell it fell in love with it it's a really it was really weird because it was a similar race format to athletics it was not really much different you're just in yeah. a straight line going as fast as you can for 200 meters um, so the race kind of profile was that yeah. competitive side of me loved it because it was exactly the same. Just just sat down and yeah. again, I, again, I that was the what I'm trying to in in para sport. There are so many disabilities yeah. that I even I was in para sport from 2013 up to 2018, and yeah. I didn't know that I was eligible for canoe. So how is someone that doesn't even so, involved in para sport? No. Yeah, it's just that that you said there a lot of you know getting in a boat. And, you know, I get in a boat and I'm seasick. You get in a boat for the first time and you win the Olympic gold medal. So, <laughs> but that's <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, a slight difference here. Yeah, I did, it was it was really good, actually, because I, I say, like, I started in the September because I waited for my kind of champs to be over. And it, I wasn't faster. I think that you need to be, my best now is 46 seconds. And I, my first kind of official time trial, once I'd learned to kind of float in the boat, not not nearly fall in, was like 72 seconds. Um oh, yeah. But I think, I say, like, I've always had this just, you know, just keep going and, then, you know, see what happens. And I, 
and it was really good that athletics and canoeing both they never put any pressure on me to like yeah you've got to make a decision because mm-hmm. how can you make a decision when you're doing a 70 second time trial to go yeah i'm gonna do this sport mm-hmm. but they both went well just do them both for the winter and you know and see, see how it goes um, and I, as I say, I keep one, I was like, right, I want to get under 70. Then I was like, right, I want to get under 60 before Christmas. Um, and the last session, my coach let me do a time trial. I was like, I know I can do it now. Right. <laughs> so I did like a 59 and a half just before Christmas. And I think the beauty of the talent transfer process is you kind of got ready trained athletes. So you're not starting from scratch as an, as an athlete, you know, yeah. you've got the gym, you've got the con- physical conditioning. Yeah. And also you get to learn and the skill in canoe, like there is skill in athletics, but you've got to control a paddle and a boat and the finite technique in canoe. There's so much to learn that I would take seconds off every week just because yeah. I was learning from the best coaches in the world. Like you, there's nowhere else where you learn a sport from scratch from the best. So I literally said, right, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really helped. And I just, yeah. And it was really satisfying for me to, you know, like, right, I've learned this new thing this week and then put it into practice and take another two seconds off my best time. And obviously that doesn't, it plateaus off a bit, but definitely when you're first learning, it's really satisfying. And also I knew that once I learned throughout the winter where you can't feel your fingers, you're freezing, like there's ice on the water, there's floods. And I loved it being out on the water. And I was like, right, if I love it in the winter, I'm definitely going to really enjoy this when yeah. the sun comes out. In the um, yeah, that was we're all still in bed, snuggled like, under you're out in that water. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all credit to you, yeah. girl. All credit like, to you. I definitely know I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah, <laughs> so literally, yeah, and then 2019 that I then kind of got kind of more competitive, and I got those right. times that got me kind of up on on the world stage, and that's when I kind of had that to make that decision that I made once before with hockey. I had to decide, you know, to pursue athletics and part of the hockey. That I then did that with. With canoe, I said it was completely unexpected. I was never planning on changing athletics, but so about 2017, you made the decision yeah. to to uh, to transfer. Uh, yeah, to it was actually beginning of yeah 2018. I first tried it, and then 2019. That's when right. I went, and the, and then also I'd got far, I'd got progressed higher, and I got a world medal. So essentially, for UK sport, I was a better athlete at canoe than I was in athletics because I got a world medal in canoeing and I'd never mm-hmm. got one in athletics. So they mm-hmm. said, look, we'll fund you for canoeing now. So that's yeah. when you you have to then make the decision, you know, that that's going to be your your main sport. But, I mean, moving on to to Tokyo and obviously coming to your, your gold medal, we had the whole COVID thing. How, and that at, at Tokyo as well, how did that impact on you? How did that impact on your training and when you actually got to the games themselves, that must have been really yeah. strange, was it not? Yeah, I think we've all defined it as like a complete roller coaster. Uh, um, because, say, for me, I was still relatively new to the sport, but I kind of established myself and I, I knew I had a chance of going to the games. Mm-hmm. Um, and it happened in March, like kind of end of March, when it was complete lockdown. We were supposed to have our selection for the Paralympic Games in April, and our selection is literally a race off, and only one person gets to go. Right, okay. Her country, and we knew we had two or three of the best in the world, and in our, you know, in GB for quite a few categories. So that that was, arguably, you know, really stressful. Mm-hmm. But also, you know, you wanted to kind of get it done and get it out of the way, and you know, see where we're at. And then, so we literally got a phone call saying, right, they're going to move selection forward to March because there might be lockdown, and we want to get selected before the games happens. Obviously, before everything got cancelled. Mm-hmm. So I was in this panic of, I've got selection in two weeks. Um, and you're like, I'm not ready. I'm, you know, not tapered. But then your brain comes in, you know, you go, right, we're going to do the best we can. And you get that rational side of, you know, let's just, the competitive side of me comes out going, right, let's just yep. go and see what happens. And then they were like, then literally two days later said, then this kind of escalation that this, we're going to go into national lockdown happened said, nope, selection has been cancelled. We'll just deal with it when we deal with it. So then you kind of had these two days of being prepared, panicking, and then you're like, relieved that kind of selection was kind of not happening in a week because it was yeah. kind of <clears throat> quite a rush and then that realization of we literally all turned up on the day before like kind of the full national lockdown got all, we're like trying to find a, a Halfords to get a roof rack for our car to take our boats home in case we were able to go on the canals and literally we were like running to the local garages trying to find a roof rack yeah. turning up getting our boats and it's really weird when you're in a full-time program you see that people every day and literally you're going we don't know when we're going to see you 
this could be a couple of weeks it could be a couple of months and that was really weird yeah. taking all your equipment home. and like, I live in a little two-bed cottage so a five meter long boat my husband really kind of yeah. enjoyed the fact that we had to have a boat living <laughs> in our house for yeah. many months and yeah that kind of that was the kind of surreal moment yeah. where you don't even know what to think and then and you kind of, we got provided luckily with an ergo that we could do like a canoe ergo in our garden. So we kind of, you know, trained for a couple of weeks, you know, fully thinking the games are going ahead. And then, so you kind of then get on a, you set yourself a schedule. I think that was really key for me having that training plan at home because it'd be really easy to just, like, yeah, I'm going to train today. And then the day gets away from you. And then you kind of got on a high because you're like, right, cool. We're all in established, sorting out when, you know, when hopefully when the canal's open, we can go back on them. And then the games get cancelled. So you then you hit this massive kind of low because as an athlete, was as any person, you know, you aim, you have targets you aim for, and that's what kind of keeps you going, and that's what drives you. And suddenly that target is taken away, and you know, to train full time, you're putting a lot of your heart and soul into it. To then go, yeah. it's a massive, <laughs> massive low. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think you you, you touched on it. Sorry, you touched on it there as well about. Um, you know, having to do things at home and your husband helping you out with things. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think I'm right in saying here that you never, anyone competing at elite sport at the highest level, you know, like you are doing, you need help from others. You need help from family members and you can't do it, I don't think, without without that help. It all comes as part of the, the package, is it? Where I'm right in saying that, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, even like people have said, oh, you went from a team sport to an individual sport how is that and I was like we you are a team like training every day we train it's only actually when you're on that start line that you're on your own and you still you know you've got people behind you like there's a say like you've got all your training partners that you know you help each other and you know pick each other up on on the bad days you've got your coaches you've got your support staff and that's in the kind of professional setting and then you got home like you know I say growing up like luckily my parents you know just they weren't kind of pushy making sure you know they won't be like you've got to you know really try and do this mm-hmm. they just were supportive in the uh, we'll drive you to hockey but tell me when you need to go to hockey yeah. we'll drive you there you know literally that you know and they were always there and they were always kind of supportive and they always you know were were there to help and then yeah my husband um especially in lockdown you know it was just you know just the two of us and yeah he ended up you know being an I mean, I got quite lucky. He, he was a trained, he's a trained S and C coach. So my gym was kind of covered by he I'd be like, oh, Tom, can you write me help me write a program now? Um and our friends down the road that had a gym in their in their garage. They, and I they help you to right, the, okay. the gym in the garage, yeah. you know. And my school, I work at, at a local school and I coach hockey and they let me take a for when I couldn't, you know, go down the road to the to the garage gym, I had a few, you know, weights at home that I mm. could you know use and I they, the school let me borrow a few of those and yeah yeah Tom like literally having to carry, helping me carry my boat to the canal when then the canal was open for four weeks into lockdown um and he'd be safe he gave me a hat and he was like safety Tom in case that you know I fell in and <laughs> and it's so key and literally my neighbors that we live in a, in yeah. a row of terrace cottages and got a 94 year old neighbor who would I mean, it'd be great, but in the middle of lockdown, you know, in the summer, she'd be trying to, she'd be handing you like champagne over the fence at nine o'clock in the morning with a, with a brunch. Um, yeah. You know, but those things that lift your spirits. And when I was training on the ergo on my own in the garden, my my neighbours like, or the postman would come around and cheer me on and things like right. that. There's there's so many people, and I think in lockdown, we're lucky we've got that community spirit here, yeah. but also yeah. that me and Tom had each other. Yeah. Um, I think so as, as well, you were, talking about friends and family i've read that uh you know we'll, we'll go on to this in a minute about uh, the actual gold medal winning race that your dad because of the the time difference and you know, the games are in tokyo your dad's screaming at 3 30 in the morning in front of the telly and your race he's jumping about like a madman um <laughs> willing you on to win i can imagine this demented man um screaming at you in the <laughs> telly so can you tell me a little bit about the race and all of that with your, your dad? Yeah, yeah, the madman in the house uh, back in England. Yeah, it's so weird to look back at those because obviously to keep your own mentality, building up to the race, they say like yeah. all of my, building up to it, you just telling it's just another race, it's just another race, you know, it's just a time, you just have, all you have to do, when, I say all you have to do, but once you get to the games and when you get to performing, it's actually all the hard work is done. The hardest thing is just doing what you normally do. 
it's so easy to as in over rapes and my straight rate goes too high because I'm too excited or you know mess your start up because you're too nervous or it's so easy that the hardest bit is just doing what you normally do yeah. so for yeah. me I just like I was just like right just focus you one shot at them. it's just another race and I I blocked out everything at home I'd like you know turned off my social media and stuff a few days before because I didn't want to keep being reminded that it was a Paralympic okay. Games because all you want to do is just do the race so it's then really lovely to them when once you finish the race and you're then out of that mental bubble that you kind of kept yourself in be, building up to it um you kind of go and do your medal ceremony and things like that like you didn't have your phone that whole time and then then to be able to call my friends and family and actually see as you say it's not just you on your own there's loads of other people there and there's loads of other people that supported you and it was so lovely to see all of that reaction like to call my parents and they were still up and buzzing I don't think they went to bed that night um and, they can give it, and then ring Tom and his parents and they're at home and yeah I think your dad is going to go to the pub by this point yeah, he, 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 was buying, he was buying drinks for the whole village at this point wasn't he <laughs> probably <laughs> so yeah. like my friends like from uni they had like a zoom watching party so I literally turned my phone on and the people like I never asked anyone to stay up with them yeah. Which, like, you, you know you can watch it on replay but those close to you obviously wanted to stay up and and watch it and so all of those that stayed up like some couple of friends from, from home market club and you saw those messages straight through and you're like wow it's four o'clock in the morning and they're all up watching and they've all sent a message you know of, of congratulations and it it means a lot to them as well because they're proud and um, and you don't you don't ever want to put that you don't want to put that on yourself before the race because you don't want to be like, oh, I'm doing it for everyone else. You're literally, you know, you're not mm. doing it for those reasons. You're doing it for yourself. But actually there's that knock-on effect of of pride and, you know, joy of those people that every single one of them have had that little input into. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there was a few headaches yeah. in your village for like a good few days after it, I think. <laughs> Particularly your dad, I think he's... <laughs> <laughs> I had to put, my husband Tom worked at a school and it was obviously on a Saturday night and then so he didn't sleep that whole night um all right yes yeah, Saturday and they um so then one of them messaged me from school that I had done my teacher training with someone that actually my husband works with now and I he said oh congratulations I just I replied back being like thank you so much I really apologize for him being tired for the first, for the Monday at school um it's completely my fault please forgive him if he's really yeah. tired and they're like it's fine it's fine but yeah, it's it's it was it was so lovely to see, and especially as you've been away in that bubble and nobody could come there because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so it was lovely to to have that kind of. I, I think you say, uh, is it? Would you rank that as your biggest achievement? Winning gold. I think so, within yeah, as in sporting achievements. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I think there's a couple of there's a couple of moments I can remember that I think one that stands out for Rio, the hundred meter final. Right. It was like the last event, the whole games. And I think that moment stands out to me as a proud moment because I was kind of ranked eighth in the world going into it. So to get into the final, I was putting loads of pressure on myself to run a PB and get into the final. And I think I'd done the 100 metres, done the 200 metres, got, got fifth in the 200. And then the 100 metre final actually was the only race I remember because I stood there. And I'd say from getting into Paralympic sport five years before, all I wanted to do to, to was go to the games or four years before. Um, and it was that one realisation that you never stop and think look it's really important to look back from where you, how far you've come mm -hmm. and I weirdly did it at the 100 meter final in Rio and I looked around and I just went I did it <laughs> it was a really weird time to notice it but I was just yeah like and I'd made the final and for me that was you know I'd I'll, I'll improve my ranking to get there mm -hmm. but that moment really stands out for me as in proud because I'd done it and I'd achieved what I would set out to achieve but definitely in terms of sporting moment that as you say the whole roller coaster of building up to yeah. it with the cancelled games so then you know, refocusing, re-getting your motivation back. We then had our selection again in April that, you know, that was a race off again for the spot that, you know, mm -hmm. I had myself and we had the world champs two weeks later and my teammate Hope got the silver. So we were one, two in the world and only one of us was allowed to go to the games, which sucks in itself. But, you know, that, that the pressure of that selection event in April, yeah. knowing that you're world number one and two, but only one of you is allowed to go. So getting but through that to then get, getting to the games COVID free. It was like, I'd say like poor Tom living with him, that especially those few weeks before when the country opened up and the cases were skyrocketing and all the Olympians had already gone and we're like, damn you, you're already out of the country mm. and mm. we've still got to wait four weeks to go and just try and not catch COVID. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then just getting there, like there's so many things to be grateful for to then actually then win the gold medal was just, mm -hmm. and then I know you plan for it and you try and, you know, but you, 
you never know what everyone else is going to pull out the bag on the day. So then for it all to happen, there's so many things to have gone right. Yeah. Get I mean, you were talking about, you know, looking back there on the steps that have been taken. What about now? What have you got anything in the pipeline? Have you got anything looking forward to you? I know you've you're involved with the 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 Mint Ridge Foundation. Can you tell me a little bit a little bit about that and what your plans are going forward? Yes. Yeah, so, well, I'm I'm not changing sport again. I'm saying we're gonna. <laughs> I was going to uh, say you're going to climb Mount Everest next week it. or something. No, no. But the really good thing about the games being delayed by a year is that there's only three years for the next one. It's the great thing. So yeah, we have champion. We have worlds and European champs every year. Yeah, so you know we've got a, we're actually having a bit of an extended break. We're having rather than two weeks off, we get about six mm. weeks of away from full training, but we're still you know keeping fit. Mm. Um, so yeah, every year that is really nice that you've got a target each year. Um, and for me, I want to get faster. I still just want to get faster, and I've tried to set myself a goal of you know trying to compete a bit more in the able-bodied categories and seeing how far I can get in there. No pressure to you know to 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 you know get to best but actually that helps me push on to get to try and get faster and faster but so that's in the kind of sporting sense but yeah for for me with the minches it's it's so nice because I've worked from the minch foundation since kind of it's it start pretty much and, mm-hmm. and I've known Alex Alex for years um, and played hockey with her and she's a huge advocate for the power of sport like yes I'm in kind of elite sport but I'm a true believer of, like sport is you can teach anything through sport and, and not just not sport and competitive sport, but activity and being active and having fun. Um, and that, that can teach you to follow your dreams for whatever career that is. Um, and, and Alex has that, you know, same belief of the power of sport and the power of sporting role models. And so I, yeah, I've, it's been really sad to not be able to go into schools and have to do it virtually over the lockdown and yeah I've had I've got one tomorrow a school visit and I had one last week so it's really nice that I've kind of finally can get back into schools because I think for young people for you know kids right the way through to teenagers you can see things on tv and whether that's a sports person whether that's a business person whether that's a celebrity whatever you want to you know do and it, it seems so separated because of the tv screen it's like your yeah. world and, and their world where it's not that, as I said, like before with disability, it's just human beings. I know, I know. You know, doing I, what they want to do. I, like, um, so, sorry, I, I, no, I mean, I've, I've said this to you before, Laura, I, on a personal note, um, um, my son has a disability. And when I told him that I was speaking to you today, you know, he watched the Paralympics from dawn till dusk when it was on. And I, I mean, I told him I was going to be speaking to you today. He was over the moon. And he was jumping up and down. Daddy, daddy, I want to, I want to see it. So I'll need to, I'll need to show him uh, this podcast um, and everything that you're saying in it because he'll be so, he'll be so excited and enthused, and I hope empowered by it. Um, and I hear as well that um, the uh, Sunday Times has put you forward as the uh, sportswoman of the, for the sportswoman of the year awards. Do you know anything about that? And, you know, can you give us a bit of an inside track? <laughs> yeah, I, well, I literally found out through when they announced them on Twitter a couple of days ago. Um, so, yeah, in the Disability Sports Women of the Year, um, it's amazing because myself, Charlotte Henshaw and Emma Wiggs, the three gold medalists from our Paracanoe team, we've all been nominated. And there's right. only, only a category of seven and we've got three of them. And it, it just goes to show, especially the women in Paracanoe. And it, we're such a minority sport, like I say. You know, you've got kind of athletics, cycling, swimming, the, the, the sports that you always see. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm a huge advocate that some kids love hockey, football, rugby at, at school, mm-hmm. but some don't. And there's actually, there's so many, that's what I say about activity. There's so many sports and activities that obviously schools can't offer canoeing, rowing because they don't have a lake. <laughs> like it's a bit more, <laughs> it's not quite as sense, but there are actually loads of clubs and for not you know you can almost you can try them for free and they're not they're very low cost and i was surprised of how many canoeing clubs there are out there and the mm. lockdown showed the amount of people that have bought kayaks sup boards um canoes mm. and i fell in love with the sport at 27 years old you know and so for to have three of us from canoeing in that shortlist is yeah it's fantastic it's so key um and to showcase that there are you know there's other sport you know and actually to branch out and try different other sports um is key so it's a, it's a huge honor to be nominated and never never even crossed my mind so then I just got a tweet and I saw it from the Sunday Times I was like 
oh um but then when, when is it when is it going ahead when is it going to be judged sorry do you know when you'll find um, out so i think the awards are the end of november so some right. of them you can vote for whereas our one is is voted for by judges um right. whereas the sports of the and team of the year you can go online you can go online now to the sunday times mm. you just google sunday times sports of the year you can go online you can read about all the nominees and you can vote for um people this is there's grassroots there's you know so it's it's not just about form and sport there's about people which i say alex for the minch foundation one that run the grassroots for the sunday times a few years ago mm -hmm. just showing what you know she's doing for grassroots sport and helping inspire kids to just get active and get involved in sport mm -hmm. um so yeah it's a huge huge honor and it's great that sometimes you know for, for sports women because as we know like to be you need to be seen to be mm -hmm. inspired and like it's the more and more coverage there is the more and more you know women's football is thriving more and more now just that's right because bbc have put it on mm -hmm. um and all it needs to be doing it is shown um and so with a women's sport b disability sport and c the minority sports such as canoeing so to be out there you've got three kind of things that that put, shift you back in that kind of hierarchy of getting shown in the media um is great because that's what the power of the olympics and the paralympics does as you said people watch it mm -hmm. but unfortunately it's only once every four years um and for young people to watch that and get inspired um it's usually the sunday time is great the mintridge for us to get directly into schools and literally yeah. talk to children and and mm -hmm. you know help inspire them is, is huge and that visibility is everything mm -hmm. with with any kind of big issue or thing that you want to get out there visibility mm -hmm. is key and I think for women's sport at the moment is is key and you said empowerment like how are how are young girls and boys meant to be empowered to do what they want to do to follow their dreams to say yes to opportunities when you don't get exposed by it it's yeah. impossible yeah so you need to get that out there and and that's what then in, inspires the next generation yeah laura um it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you this morning and as i said wait till I, my son will be over the moon when i when i show him this podcast he'll be he'll be absolutely delighted um thanks for your time i know you're a you're a busy busy woman i don't know how you've got time to actually sleep and eat all the things you're doing if you're not doing this you're doing that whatever but you're a, it's been fantastic speaking to you uh and thanks again for agreeing, agreeing to come on uh impairment what's the, the score and i hope to speak to you again shortly thanks very much thanks for having me really thank you thanks for joining us on impairment what's the score don't forget to subscribe to our channel to never miss an episode